Hello, everyone. This is Sean from the Soccer Nostalgia blog. I have the pleasure to interview Welsh football fan, Mr. Gareth Hughes. This interview is separate from a podcast series. This video interview will serve as a companion piece to written blog presentation on Wales during the 1994 World Cup qualifiers. Hello, Gareth. Welcome. Good morning, Shahan, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself and your trajectory into football? Okay, yeah. So, yes, as you said, my name is Gareth Hughes. So, uh, I'm an avid Welsh football supporter. Uh, but I've been for 43 years now. So, I had my big 50th birthday last year. First Welsh game I remember watching was um, against a very, very good Soviet Union team at the race course in uh, 1981. Obviously, it qualifies for Spain 1982 World Cup. And the first Wales game I actually went to was against Northern Ireland in the, in the old home nations back in 1982. And that was also at the race course. And um, it was well known for a couple of reasons. It was Big Neville Southall's first game for Wales. And also, um, it was Ian Rush's first goal for Wales. So it was a, a couple of landmarks there. Lad, two players who went on to be two of the greats of all time of Welsh football. Let's go back in time to the 1994 World Cup qualifiers. Can you summarize Wales's previous qualification campaigns up to this point? Yeah, it was a bit. It was a bit of a mixed bag, to be honest. In me, in my early years, it was full of near misses. Certainly from eighty two to eighty eight, a few not so near misses. Early nineties, then obviously we had to desperately lucky not to qualify, or desperately close to qualifying for ninety two and ninety four. Then forty, we had about ten years in the doldrums. Then of not even being close to qualifying. In nineteen ninety two, when this World Cup qualifier started. Can you describe the status of the Welsh national team in world football? Well, we just come off the back of two very difficult campaigns. We had, obviously, for the 1990 World Cup, we actually had the Netherlands and, and West Germany, as they were in the group. So we probably had arguably the two best teams in Europe because the Dutch had just won the European Championships and the West Germans would go on to win the, the World Cup the following year. So um, we actually put in two pretty decent performances against both the Germans and the Dutch, but we were pretty poor against Finland and you know, we didn't win a game in that group. But there's one or two performances at the end that gave us a bit of hope. And then leading into uh, Euro 92, we put in a very, 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 very good show. We just lost to a fantastic West German side in, in Nuremberg after getting off to a good start. Obviously, we got seven points from our first four games, beating a fantastic German team in Cardiff. Courtesy V and Rush, we started off pretty well with a good 3-1 victory over the Belgian team. This is all under Terry Yarrath, who'd not long got the Welsh job. we come from behind to beat them 3-1 at our new home. And then I remember we got a scrappy 1-0 win in Luxembourg. We got a very good 1-1 one, one, one draw in Brussels. Then, uh, obviously, we had the acid test against the Germans at home. So, obviously, we had a bit of luck here and there. As, as Germany, we were always going to get a, a bit more of the possession than ourselves. Germany away was going to be the next the next match. Fortunately, going into the German game in Nuremberg, when that came round, we did have a couple of injuries and a couple of suspensions. Germany just put on an absolute masterclass in, that, in the first half. The Germans were far too good for us, and it culminated with Dean Saunders lashing out to Thomas Dahl and getting sent off for, for kicking him from behind. And we were left licking our wounds, really, after that match. It was just a campaign too soon in terms of two teams qualifying for the Euros because I think had we been in any other group with four wins and a draw from six, I think we'd have probably qualified. But again, as what was quite common with Welsh football at that time, it just wasn't quite meant to be. If we compare them to the other British teams, we have at the, around this time, England and Scotland are regularly qualifying to say to the World Cups. And even in the 1980s, Northern Ireland managed right. to qualify to two World Cups. But Wales were really the lone British side that really was not reaching to the finals of tournaments. That's right, yeah. Welsh manager Terry Yorath had been appointed in 1988. And had, like you mentioned, had overseen the 1990 World Cup qualification and the 1992 Euros qualification campaigns. How was his work perceived at this point? I think I think overall very favourably. 
about seven seven years under Mike England, and again he took us so close so many times. But he was probably ready for a change by then. And I think Terry Owens, with what he did for, in in the game in Wales, I think he was very favourably received. Him, he just um, Swansea had suffered three relegations in four seasons, so he, he turned the club round there, and he, and, and he got them promoted in in his um, second full season there, and stabilised them in the old third division as it was then. Um, so initially he got the job part time, but. Um, because finances were such with the Welsh FA, it was um, it was we ne- never really going to get anyone any better. Although Brian Clough uh, at that stage was actually not far from the job in- himself, he um, everything had been agreed behind the scenes, and I think Nottingham Forest just last minute just pulled the plug on it. So um, Cloughy would have been quite a coup for Wales, but uh, yeah, we would, we were delighted to have Terry Orth and. Like I said, for, the, for that 1990 campaign, just like I said, we were just in a, it was almost Mission Impossible in a four team group featuring possibly the two best teams in Europe. It was always going to be a very, very tough ask. And, and so we proved really. We, like I said, we put in some pretty decent performances, but um, the Germans and the Dutch at that time were world class opposition. So to finish in the top two was a, was a tough ask. But um, after that, we, Put in some fairly promising performances. We came up with a new system as well, which and that set us in good stead for a few years under Terry Orth. So at this point, as far as the outside press is concerned, we have the likes of Ian Rush, Mark Hughes, Neville Southall, and Dean Saunders are considered world-class players, but with a less than stellar supporting cast. Was this the consensus in Wales as well? Um, yeah, so I'd also throw in Kevin Ratcliffe there as well because he, he was a world-class centre-half as well in his time. Yeah, there weren't many better in Europe. He had, his reading of the game was superb. He had, he had a lot of pace to spare. But they were backed up with solid lads from the old first division or uh, the Premier League as it now is. We had, other, we had others like Mark Bowen, David Phillips, Peter Nicholas, Barry Horn. We had others coming through, like Gary Speed was starting to come through. There were quite a few others, and obviously other players late, later on. But um, we, Jeremy Goss, another one I could throw in there. So they were all established lads in the old First Division Premier League. We had fairly good support, but for, for whatever reason, it didn't quite happen until the, the cup two campaigns, two successive campaigns under Terry Ard in the 1990s. It was a... It was just full of near misses. There was quality in other areas too, not, not to the not to the extent of the Ross Shoes, Saunders Axis, and then Neville and Kevin Ratcliffe at the back. But um, yeah, Welsh fans would accept there was perhaps um, we perhaps didn't have quite the quality in other areas to just get us over the line. Around 1991-92, we have the emergence of a teenager, Ryan Giggs who is compared to be the next George Best and other such high praises like that. Can you describe his status at this point and expectations placed on him around this time? Well, not much was heard of gigs, to be honest, when he first burst onto the scene with regards to in, in, with regards to the Welsh fans. It was only because he didn't come through the Welsh youth systems because he'd lived all his life in most of his life in Manchester, so he came through sort of the English school system. So he didn't play any representative football for Wales up until he got to the senior team. So when he got into the United team, then we obviously seen what what talents we had on our hands. So, um, yeah, to put him in the same league as George Best is high praise indeed, but um, it certainly caused a lot of excitement in Welsh football scene. Well, we had a, a future star for possibly the next 15 years or so. And, yeah, so he proved. So we already discussed the backbone of this team and other names to throw around. We have the likes of Clayton Blackmore from Manchester United, Mark Azelwood. At this time, he was playing at Bristol City. Andrew Melville, Mark yep. Pembridge. Like you said, a lot of them were either from like mid-level Premier League yeah. type players or maybe even championship players. It was a small group of players, really, if you really think about it. Not much depth. We also had Eric Young as well, who newly qualified for us. Uh, quite an experienced centre-half. Played for Wimbledon and Crystal Palace when they were actually probably top six, top seven Premier League old first division side. So he was quite a useful addition as well. And then we had people like Kit Simons as well, who were, who were pushing him quite close. So we had a little bit of cover. But um, so the backbone of the side um, was a, a 3 4 one, two formation. So we had three very experienced centre-halves in uh, in Ratcliffe who played the sweeper because Terry Orrath at the end of 1990 decided to go, go with a, a three at the back. And, uh, and it, it actually worked. 
worked at speed because we found, we found a way of accommodating Hughes, Saunders and Rush up front, which hadn't always been the case. A lot of the time, Saunders had to play out on the right wing just to accommodate him. So we we played Hughes a bit deeper behind Saunders and Rush and that worked very, very well for us and the sides were a lot more balanced. We had, obviously, Kevin Macklin for sweeper, Mark Aislewood, Eric Young either side of him and then and two good wing backs in, in Clayton Blackmore on the right and Paul Bowden on the, on the left were probably a bit more attack-minded than defensive-minded full-backs. And then we had two Tigerish midfielders in Barry Horn and Peter Nicholas. So um, it was, it was, the sides were a lot more balanced as a result of that. Where were you in life as these qualifiers rolled around? So around 1991, I was just in college and also I was learning to drive, and which I, I passed my test about a month before the German, the German game in Cardiff in 1991. So I was learning to drive, which obviously gave me a bit more license to to go to a lot more Wales games. But th- those days, there was a regular, we'd catch supporters buses from, from the the race course ground in Wrexham to the um to the centre of Cardiff and then catch the buses back. So um they were they were great days. The bus journey seemed long, but they were they were great days. And so I remember them I remember them very, very well. I watched Wales a lot away from home as well. And ninety three would have been my first away game in Ostrava against Czechoslovakia as they were then. But unfortunately as I said, I was also in college and um we had an exam move the day before move from the previous week to the day before the Wales Czechoslovakia game and or the Czechoslovakia Wales game, so I couldn't attend because of the exam. So I was a, I was very disappointed because obviously yeah, everything had been paid for. But there you go. It, it's always been followed. They've off with the smooth the Wales, and that was a, a good example of that. Wales were to be in a group with Romania, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Cyprus, and Faroe Islands. Now, the first three teams mentioned had qualified to the previous World Cup in 1990. Yeah. What was the belief from Welsh fans at this point regarding qualification chances? I, th- I think we're still pretty optimistic. Yeah, it was a very tough group. Um, oddly enough, the three sides you mentioned, they, they didn't actually qualify for the Euros. They'd just gone in 92, but they all did pretty well in the World Cup. Two of them got to the last 16. Um, so we knew it was going to be a very tough group because... The main you were quite an emerging side. Uh, they they promised quite a lot in the in the from the late eighties to the early nineties onwards. And you see you see sides like Stoya Bucharest doing very well in Europe. Belgium, you know, they they were led by the the brilliant Enzo Schifo. So they were perhaps a bit of an agency, but they were still a, still quite a force. Czechoslovakia is, is always a very difficult place to go and get a result, and they had they had good players in Serie A like uh, Lubos Kubik, uh, and Thomas Skouravi was uh, making a name for himself in Europe, and of course, um, as communism and the, and the Berlin Wall had been knocked down, and a lot of those players they were now free to apply their trades in the likes of Germany, Italy, Spain, and uh, people like John Georgi Hadji, who was a um, great playmaker from Romania, and he was he, he was very much their leader, but they had some very good players behind them as well. So probably going into that group, Romania and Belgium would have been the favourites for many people. But I was very optimistic of us qualifying because we had a sellout every, pretty much every match at the old Cardiff Arms Park. And with that crowd behind us, I, th- I thought there was a good chance we could qualify. And although we obviously... We did need to beat one of the big three away from home somewhere along the line and hope others would drop points. So um, it was going to be interesting how those 10 games panned out for sure. But uh, we're very excited going into it after a pretty, albeit not a successful 1992 qualifying campaign. It was, um, it was certainly, we, we'd made massive strides. And so we were pretty much a match for anyone by then. The World Cup qualifiers started on May 20th, 1992 at Bucharest. That's right. And in the worst way possible. Romania won 5 1. In fact, they scored their five goals in the first half. First half, yeah. Before no, Ian better. Rush pulled the goal back in early second half. Already, qualification chances looked bleak after one match. Very, I would say, yes. I'd actually booked an afternoon off work that day because um, obviously our game was a slightly earlier kickoff, and also it was the same day as the um, Barcelona Sampdoria European Cup final at Wembley. So yeah. I thought, what a, fan- what a fantastic afternoon and evening of sport to look forward to. So I booked an afternoon off work, and o- oddly enough, the bus didn't turn up to pick me up because it was it broke down. So by that t- so I decided to walk home, and I got home. We were already four 0 down half an hour into the game, so perhaps it wasn't too bad a thing. The bus broke down, and then, uh, but yeah. 
Uh, but what was interesting was two days before that game against Romania was Terry Yarath announced we we're going to play with a flat back four. And for two years, we've been playing with a sweeper system and it worked very well. And we got good, good results, as we previously mentioned, against the likes of Belgium, Brazil, Germany. And to go with a back four against that Romanian team, I thought, was, was, was asking for trouble because... Technically, they were a superb team, and we knew they had a lot of pace all over the t- uh, all over the, all over the side, a lot of creativity, and they just basically ran through as Dean Saunders again. Thought he was shunted over to the right wing. We just unbalanced and lopsided, and we five 0 down at half time. It was just damage and limitation exercise, and as you said, Rushy got an early consolation goal second half, so we we won the second half, but. We certainly left Bucharest with egg on our faces, and in many ways, it felt in in those days it was two points for a win. But in those days, it felt like we were three points behind already because of the goal difference, and that's going to take a little bit of clawing back. Because whilst Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Wales, Romania were probably all going to take points off each other, they were not, no one was going to lose five one to any of those sides. So um, straight away, we felt like we did have a mountain to climb. Yes, absolutely, but. Uh, we did learn a lesson in it wasn't broken with a back three, so we shouldn't have tried to fix it. And a lot of those goals, they just ran through us and we just needed that extra defender at times. And then it kind of summed it up when Neville Southall let a 35 yard from Hadji into the top corner that 99 times have a 100 either save. And you know that wasn't the first time I'd go on to say that in this campaign, but we were outclassed. They were a fantastic side and they were coming of age Romania as we see in, in later years. So, um, no complaints over the results. We lost to a far, far better team, but um, it just was on the back foot, like you said. Following this match, just days later, in a friendly, Wells lost 4-0 to the Netherlands. Then they embarked on a tour of okay. Japan to play in the Kirin Cup. They lost to Argentina 1-0 in June. A couple of days later, they defeated the host Japan 1-0. These three friendly results after the Romanian match did not exactly inspire confidence. The the Dutch game, I think, was a bit of a hangover from the Romanian from the Romanian match. So that probably wasn't a great surprise. We a record against the Dutch is is um, pretty poor to say the least. So we probably had a hangover going into that game, and there's no surprise we got quite a heavy defeat to what was a world class Dutch team. But then, as you said, we flew over to Japan with a little bit of a scratch team. We didn't have Ian Rush didn't travel over, and one or two others didn't travel over. Kevin Ratcliffe didn't travel over. But Argentina only scored against us with an injury time free kick from Batty Stuta. But we matched him fairly well for the other 90 minutes. And then we beat Japan courtesy of a goal from Mark Bowen. So at least we ended off off the campaign on a bit of a positive, but with a lot of work to do in 1992 and uh, 1993. At least we knew what what we had to do going forward. The 1992-93 season starts with another qualifier on September 9th at Cardiff against Faroe Islands. And Wells, as was expected, won comfortably 6-0. Ian Rush scored a hat trick. Right. Uh, Dean Saunders, Mark Bowen, and Clayton Blackmore scoring the other goals. Yeah, so it clawed back the goal difference, but I don't think the Faroe Islands are going to pick up any points against anybody. We just we just did quite a professional job on them. Really, it was it was not much more than that. It was a pretty miserable night in Cardiff. If I remember quite well, it wasn't well attended. It was just a case of getting the job done, really. And thankfully, we did claw back the goal difference. We were a substantial deficit with the goal difference that we had due to losing heavily in Romania a few months earlier. So it stood us in good stead going into the next game against Cyprus, at least. Yes. Obviously, we we knew it was going to be the weather conditions were going to be far different and the pitch was going to be far different and so on. So we had to prepare accordingly for that. But at least we got the points in the in the bag and some goals under our belt. So, um, yeah, it was positive overall, yes. So the next match was on October 14th at Limassol against Cyprus. Wells won 1-0 away from home with a Mark Hughes goal. That's right. Uh, they just did the minimum to get the yeah. points and leave. It was the same because um, Cyprus, although again not not particularly strong side, they were capable of taking points here and there off other side. It, it was a difficult place to go, and, and the days of Cyprus losing quite heavily were, were sort of gone by that stage. So again, it's just a professional job. It wasn't a great pitch we played on. Obviously, it was still heat was still pretty stifling over there in in October, and yeah, we were well organised at the back. Cyprus created very little, and then Mark Hughes scored a very good header from a, from a corner kick. Again, it was job well done, but. You know, we knew we had far tougher games to come and they probably didn't come much tougher than our next game in Belgium. 
So the next match at Belgium was on November 18th at Brussels. And by this point, Belgium had taken a commanding lead in the group. That's right. And at this point, they looked like likely qualifiers and with the second place up for grabs by the time they'd met Wells. So this match, Belgium would win 2-0 yep. uh, with goals by Lorenzo Stalens and Mark de Grijsse. Wells had lost to their second rival in the group. Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's no Martin forever really after that game. Lorenzo Stanley scored a good good goal early second half. He a side footer from the um around fifteen yards out. Belgium were the slightly were the better side pretty much throughout the game. Then um, there was a mistake from Eric Young, a, a long goal kick from Belgium's brilliant keeper at that time, Michel Perdot. Young missed the clearance and then the guys went through and scored. But again, we were it was a very lacklustre performance from Wales. It wasn't it wasn't a great evening, but we, we didn't play well enough on the night. We left Brussels with a lot of work to do. And I think we were clamouring, obviously by then we were clamouring for the likes of Ryan Giggs to play, just, just, to, just to freshen things up a little bit. We come to the calendar year 1993. On February 17th, Wells play friendly against the Republic of Ireland and they lose 2-1. But then in March, there's the return fixture against Belgium, this time at home. That's right. Now, for this match, Kevin Ratcliffe came out of international retirement. Can you explain the circumstances of his surprise recall? He hadn't really been getting any game time for Everton. By then, he's probably third, fourth choice defender even by then. So he moved to Cardiff City and um, Cardiff at that time were quite an amb- ambitious to get into the Premier League. They were bankrolled by a, a chap called Rick Wright. So he, Kevin Ratcliffe joined there to get game time and also help Cardiff's promotion push. And he was the final piece of the jigsaw with regard to that. So, but I don't think any, uh, Welsh fans had any concerns about him coming out of perhaps semi-retirement, if you like, against Belgium. His reading of the game was still second to none. He still had that yard of pace. And um, it, was, it was not the first time and it wasn't the last time Wales were to pick players really from the lower divisions of English football. He had so much experience behind him. So I think that overall he's, he's felt a positive because a, a little bit of experience at, at the back and someone who could organise the back would be, it would be great with the likes of Kit Simons playing. I was happy to see Ratcliffe back and in, in such a make-or-break game as well. So I think it was a, it was a good call from Terry Orrath. At this point now, from this moment on, Ryan Giggs is a starter for Wells. He opened the scoring in this match with a free kick. Oh, yeah. And then Ian Rush scored a second goal and Wells got a much needed win against the group leaders to kickstart their qualification campaign. Absolutely, yes. So yeah, I think they've been a bit of clamour for gigs to start for quite some time and probably rightly so as well. But Terry played a, a 3-4-1-2 formation and, and didn't really deviate from that much, very much. And he was pretty much the same personnel from start to finish. But there was clamour for gigs by then because he'd been a regular in a very good Manchester United side for, for that season and a half. Scored some superb goals that season. He scored a brilliant individual one against Tottenham very early in the season and against Sheffield United in the well in the uh, FA Cup a month or two earlier. And so he, he was ready to be unleashed, really. It was a, it was a breath of fresh air when he played because, we um, again, we changed the formation slightly. We played a, a, probably a bit more attacking because we played Mark Hughes in, as the defensive midfielder that day. So it meant we had a, a trio up front of Saunders, Rush, and uh, and gigs, so it just had another dimension to the attack. And we played Barry Horn a fullback, so there's a few positional changes. But we basically went for Belgium from the start. And gigs scored a brilliant free kick early on, and Belgium had a very good keeper in Michel Perdome, but he he didn't come close to stopping it. And then some good work from Dean Saunders down the left channel, and he put in a good cross for Rush to make it two nil. And to be fair, it was a comfortable two nil because, as you said, Belgium had all but qualified by then, so it was a make or break game for us. And um, oddly enough, in the end, Belgium, run, as runaway leaders, only just qualified in the end, courtesy of their start. But um, it was, yeah, we had to win that game or, or we were out. I don't even think a draw would have been good enough. So um, thankfully, we left uh, with two points. And now we, we really felt like we had some momentum. Now we finally had gigs in that starting 11. The next match is on the following month on April 28th. Uh, Wells travels to Ostrava. They're facing what is now a nation. We have to remind everyone that 
Czechoslovakia broke up at the end of 1992. So in yeah, 1993, right. <clears throat> this team was called the Republic of Czechs and Slovaks because Czech, right, yeah. Czech Republic and Slovakia were separate nations. Now. But the team remained united until the end of qualifiers with this That's name. That's right, yeah. yeah. That- so for this match, Wells took the lead through Mark Hughes in the 31st minute. But... In the 41st minute, the Republic of Czechs and Slovaks tied the match through Radoslav Latal. But yeah. nevertheless, it was a positive result away from home. Um, I think if, if you said to us we get a draw beforehand, I think we'd have probably accepted that because the old, the old Czechoslovakia was a very t- difficult place for a lot of teams to get a result. Uh, we, we were no exception to that. We very, very, I don't think we ever did get any positive results prior to this game from there and actually looking back we were actually disappointed to get a draw in the end which was probably a sign of how thing how far Welsh football had come and after the Belgium game it was a it was a little bit of a letdown because they, they weren't quite in the same league as the Belgian team but uh, as you said Mark he, was, he scored a very good goal around the half hour mark he just he was just too strong for his mark and putting a good finish in the bottom corner but we did concede a very sloppy goal right on half time second half there wasn't a great deal of quality Probably Lubos Kubik, who would he was around who had had a spell at Fiorentina just after Italia ninety. He he was pulling a lot of strings in midfield, so we didn't really get close to him and we didn't really create an awful lot in the second half. And a draw was a fair result, but there was two it, it looked like it was two sides battling for third and fourth place. It didn't on that showing neither side would have done enough to get through to the to the States. But um we left a little bit disappointed. Before the game, we'd have been happy with the draw, but disappointed afterwards because it was a decent Czech team, but it was a, it was a far from great Czech team. They, they had one or two players missing. Skuravi was missing. I remember seeing that before the game, and I was quite pleased to, to see that because he, he's a handful for any defence in that era. But um, we should have played a lot better, but we unfortunately we didn't, and we came away with a draw. So we, we're kind of hoping now for one or two other sides to take points off the likes of Romania and Belgium going, going forward. Wells closed off the 1992-93 season with a match at Toftir against Faroe Islands. And again, it was a comfortable win. Wells won 3-0. Saunders, Eric Young, and Ian Rush scoring the goals and picking up the points as was expected of them. Yeah, again, a bit bit like the, the game from the previous September and the Cyprus game the following month. It, it was just a job well done, really. Exactly. It was just a case of finishing the season on a high note and then taking that momentum into the following season because we we finished off with three home games, which is probably all we could ask, really. And it kept qualification within our hands. And again, after the poor start, I think that's all we could have asked for as well. But we knew we had um, two very tough games at home to come. So we ended the season on quite a high note. And I think there's quite a lot of optimism going into the 93-94 qualifiers. So the 1993-94 season, the first qualifier is on September 8th at Cardiff against the Republic of mm-hmm. Czechs and Slovaks. Pavel Kuka gives the Czechs and Slovaks the lead in the 16th minute. However, before halftime, Wells takes a 2-1 lead with Ryan Giggs and Ian Rush scoring the goals. But in the second half, the late Petar Dubovsky Scored yeah, so. scored from a free kick. The match ended as a tie, a two-two tie, and I think Wells missed a great opportunity by not winning at home. To a degree, yes, but I think it, it was actually um, oddly enough we left we left Ostrava disappointed only getting a draw. We left Cardiff actually fairly happy about getting a draw because I felt that Czech Slovak or the, the Czech and Slovakian representatives was a far better team in Cardiff than the one we faced in Ostrava. They'd made quite a few changes. As you said, Peter Dubovsky being one of them. Uh, he just secured a big move to Real Madrid. Uh, Lubomir Miravchik, who went on to do good things at Celtic, he, he he was recalled. Pavel Kuka, as you mentioned, was recalled. The experienced midfielder, Ivan Hasek came back. He he was recalled, but um, Dubovsky was very much in the mold of a typical number ten left-footed playmaker from the old Eastern Bloc. He's a 
technically a superb player, and he, he ran the game from start to finish. Really, I, I could see why he made he did have a big money move, but um, and sadly his career didn't quite pan out. And obviously there was that tragedy in Thailand a few years later with regards to Dubovsky. Just um, just going off track a little bit. I've spoken. I've got quite a few friends in Slovakia, and we talked to him about Slovakian football, and they said he was their greatest, even better than Hamsik. So that's pretty much how how highly he's rated over there. But going back to the game, like I said, yes, um, Kuka scored a very early goal. Um, that was a little bit of a result of poor defending. We cleared the corner and 40 mark. He was dithered a little bit on the edge of the penalty area. He was dispossessed. And after what seemed like an endless number of ricochets, it landed at Pavel Kuka, who was, had an open goal basically from just about eight yards out. So we knew then we were in for a very, very difficult 90 minutes but like I said we replied, we responded well with um, two good goals from Giggs and Rush first one was a great cross from Phillips and Giggs got in ahead of his mark and just put a left footer past um, Petr Kuba the Czech goalkeeper and then the second goal a bit later was um, you know, a great team goal again came from the right and a, a good crossover from the right good cushion header from Giggs and Rush span off his marker superbly and slid it under under Kuva. So half time probably didn't come as a good time for us because we, we really had them on the ropes by then I felt and I thought there was only one team going to win and but they came out in the second half and again they were technically a superb side, very, very good on the break and then they brought their giant forward Scravi on. He won the free kick some thirty yards out, which Dubo- Peter Dubovsky put in the top corner. But it was a it was an end to end game. It wasn't great for me health to watch, but it was a, if you was a neutral fan, you'd have enjoyed it. There was sort of shades of Liverpool Newcastle four three about it a couple of seasons later, but it, it could have been any score. I remember thinking with remember seeing with two minutes ago. Dean Saunders ran through. He was clear on goal. Got past two or three Czech defenders. And then um, Petr Kuba, who wasn't always the most reliable keeper, somehow tipped it over. And then literally last kick of the game, there was an almighty goal mouth scramble in our end. And uh, thankfully we cleared it and that was literally the last kick of the game. And so we finished 2-2 and I was disappointed to finish 2-2. But um, in in a way, I was looking back on the bus journey because they were a very, very good side and um, because they got themselves back into contention. I think it was actually a point gained. It was a great international game. Players gave everything on both sides. But again, it was still in our hands with two to go. We had on paper a slightly easier game to come up, coming up next as well. So the next match was on October 13th at Cardiff against Cyprus. And Wells won 2-0, but they kind of had to leave it late. Uh, yeah, Dean Saunders <laughs> scored in the 70th minute. And Ian Rush in the 81st minute. But Wells picked up the maximum points going into the final match. That's right. Yeah, there wasn't a great deal of quality in that game. Um, Sackler was quite happy to kick us, to just kick us off the pitch, really. And then their fullback actually said in the press he was going to kick gigs. And so he proved. And, but uh, he, he, he kicked him once too often. And the referee just lost patience with him. And, and he was given a red card. So it was a scrappy performance. It was just about getting the points, really. Um, so like you said, we got two late goals. Uh, after having struggled to break down what was a pretty stubborn Cypriot team. Thankfully, as you said, Saunders and Rush scored. But unfortunately, that was mad because we had two suspensions to two very key players in Mark Hughes and Mark Hazelwood. The Mark Hughes one in particular was very disappointing because he lunged in for a ball. He was never going to win and caught the Cypriot player very late. So he was a, a very easy card, a yellow card for the referee to give. So that was a that was a big disappointment. Whilst I knew probably Gary Speed would be his replacement and would do it and would do a great job for us. So I wasn't wasn't sure if he'd be if it'd be the biggest loss, but any side without Mark Hughes was always going to be weaker without him. And also, we it would lift the um, the away team, and in this case, Romania, no end. Not seeing Mark he used his name on the team sheet, and so um, we went into that game with that with a couple of key players missing, but still very confident because we now knew what we had to do. And again, it was in our hands. Last game at home, it was. Um, we just hope the gods were smiling on us really now, but we knew it was, what a difficult game we had in store. So we come to this dramatic November 17th, 1993 match at home at Cardiff against Romania. Now, going into this match, depending also upon the Belgium and Czech-Slovaks match, Wales had a chance, an outside chance to qualify for the World Cup if they defeated Romania. Right, yeah. which is amazing given how they have started a qualification campaign. 
So that really clawed their way back to this Absolutely, point. Absolutely, yeah. So Romania takes the lead through George Haji in the 32nd minute. Haji scores with a long-range shot from outside of the box. Wells tied a match in the 61st minute through Dean Saunders. Then a few minutes later, there's a penalty kick. Penalty, yeah. Yeah. And everyone knows how this has entered Welsh football history folklore. The yeah. normally reliable Paul Bodin misses the demoralized Welsh side, concede another goal with five minutes left through Florin Raduchoyu, and the dream is gone. Yeah, I, mem- I remember on the way down, um, i got to be honest with you, um, my heart said, yes, Wales were going to win and what we were finally going to do it. But my head, it, my head thought, that I, I don't think so, sadly, because it was a, they were a superb side, that Romanian team, that led by the brilliant Georgie Hadji, as, as mentioned earlier. So we, we knew what a difficult game we were going to get. But um, the atmosphere of the old Cardiff Arms Park was absolutely electric. So we, we'd hope that would lift the players that, uh, that little bit more too. And But we could see from the kickoff it was going to be a very long 90 minutes because we could we could just not get near them at all. Hadji was drifting all over the pitch. We just couldn't get, get the ball off them. They looked they look like they are going to score at will. Dumitrescu and Petrescu, they, they both had good chances. And um, we just sat them down a little bit then. And people talk about Paul Bowden penalty, but Neville Southall that conceded a very, very poor goal, as you said, from a long-range shot from Hadji from about 25 yards out. Uh, for 999 times out of a thousand, Big Nev would have saved it, and it just bobbled, bobbled under him. Uh, so yeah, then obviously, like I said, uh, we got an equaliser early second half. We knew um, a victory by two goals would have clinched the uh, qualification for us. A victory by one goal would have been dependent on the Czech, Czech and Slovakia game in Belgium. So that that came uh, the one goal victory came with sort of strings attached, if you like. But as you said, yes, we had the penalty. Um, speed was felled by um, Dan Petrescu. And then Paul Bowden, as you said, so reliable, scored the penalty to clinch promotion for Swindon into the Premier League just a few months earlier. So we we had a bit of bad luck in penalties when Scotland benefited from a penalty against Wales for the Argentina World Cup in 78. Scotland again benefited with a controversial penalty against us in 85 for Mexico 86. So we thought maybe now the, the gods were starting to smile on us. I was fairly hopeful of and optimistic of Bowden scoring, and he couldn't have hit the ball any better, but he, he hit it that hard, hit the bar that hard, it bounced about 30 yards back. And you could see that just knocked the stuffing out of the players and knocked the wind out of our sails. The crowd was quiet. And then Romania just gradually got foothold in the game. And you know, we, we were taking off defenders, putting midfielders on, taking off midfielders off, putting forwards on. So Terry Off is doing everything. I don't think Terry Off could have done any more. What you remain, you scored, uh, got a foothold in the game and then got a breakaway goal with a few minutes to go and then it was mission impossible then. And yeah, he was just, again, typical of Wales that time. He's just very close, but no cigar, if you like. But is it, Obviously, that penalty's talked about a lot. It's still talked about to this day, but um, not many people talk about Neville Southall's mistake. And it's due to, mainly due to Southall's brilliance for us over his 15 or 16 years with Wales. So a couple of things against such a good side, a couple of mistakes against such a good side, we just couldn't afford to make that. And, and ultimately that did cost us. And uh, I think also that feeling on the way home, because we had, it was, an, it was an aging team by then, although we had some promising players coming through. We knew he was probably the last chance Terry Orr as a manager had of qualifying. Ian Rush, Mark Hughes, Neville South, or Dean Saunders, we probably was their last chance of playing in the World Cup. And we could also throw in other players, the likes of Mark Bowen, Dave Phillips, Eric Young. They were all over 30 by then. Barry Horn, likewise. A promising batch of youngsters coming through. That perhaps just wasn't... They, we didn't have that. those players around the mid to late 20s in their prime at international football who were quite good enough. So we suffered for quite some time after that. And there was that feeling. And there was no surprise what happened over the next 10 years happened to Welsh football. Wells's inability to win at home against two of their main rivals was really their undoing. Hundred percent, yes. We you know, we beat the two minnows. We won that. We got four out of our five wins by beat, doing the double over the two minnows. And then when it came to Belgium, Czechoslovakia, then representatives of the Czechs and Slovaks and the Romanian, we won one out of those six games. We got a couple of draws against the Czechs and Slovaks. 
Uh, so we got basically four points from six games. And I did actually have a look a, a few weeks back just to see how the others did. And they, Belgium and they mainly took seven points from those six games in the head-to-heads. And that was ultimately the difference. Those three points were the difference. But we we didn't do enough against the big teams. And actually England, oddly enough, they did, did similar in their campaign. They didn't beat the big teams in their campaign. We didn't do it in our campaign. And so overall, there's, there's no complaints about not qualifying. It was just... It was just such a shame that we had such a good generation of players who'd never quite got that chance at a major final. We come back to this question of lack of depth within the Welsh squad <laughs> as Wales more or less relied on the same lineup from match to match, not many changes. Was this a factor as well, you think? To a degree, yes. But I think you could also say that about Belgium, Romania, and and the Czechs, they had the same group of core players really that they depended on in in terms of qualifying. And in that year, that that year, it wasn't uncommon for players to play fifty or sixty games in a in a year. Squad rotation wasn't really a thing a, a thing back then, and it, it it was pretty much impossible to drop people like Ian Rush, Mark Hughes, because we didn't have forwards anywhere near their ability as backup. And obviously Neville Southall in goal, but we had some sort of solid players. We had the first choice wing backs would. Blackburn, Bowden, and then if they weren't available, we had people like Mark Bowden and Dave Phillips. So there wasn't perhaps a big drop in standard in in those positions. Midfield, we had either Jeremy Goss, Gary Speed, either side of Mark Hughes, either side of Barry Horn. So again, three three players of reasonable similar ability. So again, perhaps not a big drop, but in terms of the forwards, yes, we didn't have anyone close to Ian Rush, Dean Saunders, who, who, we could, who could score goals for us, uh, or lads who could perhaps create a little bit further behind. So yeah, you saw the three sides of the, the finished above us: Peter uh, in Dubovsky, Hadji, and um, Enzo Schifo. They had three; all three sides had classic playmakers. We didn't quite have a side with that creativity, or a player who could have who had that creativity to unlock a unlock a defence. We had reasonable depth, but not perhaps enough depth as the bigger nations would have had. Let's discuss the aftermath. Terry Yorath was sacked to be replaced by John Toshak. Was this a justified decision in your opinion? Uh, no, I didn't think it was justified at all. I think Terry Yorath had done more than enough to earn a contract and for the next campaign or and even beyond. It was clear we needed a rebuild. And I think Terry Yorath would have been the man to do that because he, he, knew, he knew the players, he knew the setup. We had a useful batch of players coming through then. Had people like Chris Coleman who were pushing hard. Gary Speed has, had established himself. Giggs had established himself. People like Mark Pembridge, slightly lower down the scale. And we had John Hartson, who was pushing through. Nathan Blake, another one who just secured a move to Sheffield United. So so we had a promising group of players coming through. And I thought Terry Yard would have been the man to do that. And his decision, it was quite rightly met with division and anger from Welsh fans. It wasn't, um, no, it was not a good decision at all. And I believe it was only over about £10,000 a year extension or, or, or a pay rise, which... Um, and forty, the Welsh football at that time, or the, or the people who ran Welsh football at that time, were not exactly renowned for being in touch with with modern day football. Then, yeah, and then it was, um, yeah, it was a very poor decision, and you know, Welsh football suffered quite badly as a result of that for a good few campaigns to come. I was quite excited about John Toshak replacing Terry Arthur, though, because Toshak then was was in his prime as a manager compared to perhaps the Toshak we had ten years later. So I was still fairly quite excited to have Toshak. So someone. New ideas. He'd been there, seen he'd done as both a player and a manager, but I wasn't happy about him managing Wales on a part time basis and still managing his club in Spain. I couldn't see how that was going to work. It was no surprise that it didn't work. Uh, his, his first and only game was almost a f- f- farce, really, because we played a streetwise Norwegian team who were far better than us on the day, he outplayed us. We had five or six players playing out of position. I, I can remember quite well, actually, we had Jason Perry, who was a Cardiff City centre half, playing at right wing back. Dave Phillips, centre midfielder of Forest, playing a left wing back. Ian Rush playing defensive midfield. It was um, Gary Speed, I think, was on the right wing. Nathan Blake was on the left wing. He were midfielders and, and centre forward. So we had five or six players out of position. We were 3 0 down. The Welsh fans chanted, We want Yorath back. And I think John Tossack knew that this this it, this couldn't work. And I don't think, I think, to be fair to John, I don't think he knew the full story behind Terry Yorath sacking. So he, he probably did the right thing and left Wales at that time. And so we was very much back to the drawing board then because we knew we had a very hard campaign for the 1996 Euros in England. 
what were the takeaways from this campaign? Well, obviously, the introduction of Giggs was was the highlight. He now established himself as a world class talent, both with Manchester United and with Wales. The rest of it really was it was just unfortunately a near miss for a lot of our aging stars. As I mentioned, a few of the players earlier, they they were start now pushing for, for start for a starting place in the Welsh side. Probably about if it was to mark it out of ten, I'd probably give it a six out of ten. It, we basically did, we beat the minnows, did the the minimum there. Beat a very good Belgium team, but just didn't do enough against the good sides, and it just showed we just didn't have that little bit of extra quality that you need to get us over the line in terms of qualifying for tournaments on a on a more regular basis. It did set us back a good ten years because um, unfortunately we had a, a raft of player retirements. Attendances were starting to take a, a dip. The game was not very well run, and also there were some poor managerial appointments in amongst that. So um, it took a good ten years for Welsh football to recover from that you mentioned earlier this is really the end of the road for the likes of ian rush and mark hughes and dean saunders as far as ever playing in a major tournament in closing overall how is this qualification campaign looked upon by welsh football historians and fans alike well, it all, probably all comes down just to the to the Bowdoin missed penalty. Because I think had that had gone in, I think we would have gone on to win because we, whilst Romania were a good, good side, they were perhaps a bit temperamental and perhaps a bit fragile at the back. If they was if they did have a weakness, that would that was where it was. But as a, it, obviously, it's talk it's the, the pole Bowdoin penalty is what's talked about the most. Like I said, unfortunately, Neville Southall also made a, a mistake in that game that doesn't get talked about as much because of his consistency and his excellence of both Everton and Wales again it's just talked about we had so many near misses in the 80s and 90s so it's, it's talked about in, in pretty much the same light as them because decisions went against us in previous qualifying campaigns and this time unfortunately we, we were the architects of our own downfall really by not doing enough in, in the in the last in the two of the last three home games against the Czechs and Romania so again very close but just not we just weren't quite good enough um, like in quite a few of our campaigns in over over the time I've been following Wales. With that, I would like to thank you for your participation in this interview. Also, remind everyone to please read the main blog article as well for more detail. The link is included on the video upload description along with our respective contact informations. So thank you once again. No, thank you, Shahan, and really enjoyed talking about it. Brought back some good memories and bad memories, but that pretty much sums up my life following Wales. Yeah, thanks so, again. Yeah, but hope to speak to you again. Thank you, Shahan.